so this chapter three is uh, fo focus on gelatinization, pasting, and retrogradation. Someone asked me, Pat Hoon or a few others, asked me what is the difference between gelatinization and retrogradation. So basically, you know, we can we can uh, describe pasting and gelatinization as the event. Um, that occur. Gelatinization is part of the whole pasting. So make it uh, think think it uh, think uh, in in that way. Yeah, gelatinization is part of the whole pasting event. When we say events, it's a sequence of uh, stages in the pasting process. If you look at this chapter, because uh, well, if you don't want to take it from me, uh, maybe if you go through this chapter, um, under pasting, it says here, uh, of this paragraph, uh, okay, from here, the following proposed definition of the pasting process differentiates it from gelatinization. Pasting is a phenomenon following gelatinization in the dissolution of starch. It involves granular swelling, which is part of gelatinization. The onset of gelatinization should start with, ons with, should start with the swelling of the granules. Exudation of molecular components from the granule as the granules swell, more and more of the low molecular weight amylose chain would diffuse or leach out from the granules. And eventually, total disruption of the granule. Once the granule reach the maximum swelling capacity, it will it will uh, start to sort of uh, break up, fractured, disrupted, yeah, uh, especially in the presence of shear. It is important to note, however, the, that pasting is not exactly separate from gelatinization but rather an overlapping occurrence perhaps best described as a continuation of gelatinization. Although there is no definitive point at which gelatinization ends and pasting begins, pasting is, is usually related to the development of viscosity. However, uh, however, this link between gelatinization and pasting often results in these two terms being used interchangeably to describe the same process. Behun? <laughs> so, happy with this explanation? Yeah. Or, or if you like, I, I, I would rather think of the paste uh, gelatinization as part of the whole pasting process or if you like, like a subset, so on. Yeah. So then, don't get confused. Uh, when starch undergo gelatinization, finally it will form starch paste. If the concentration is, if the water content is uh, reasonably high, more than 60%, if the water content is less, then from paste we can get gel. Even actually, we can, uh, from paste, when we cool it down, the starch will undergo retrogradation, then finally we would get maybe gel to form. Okay. Always disappear. So this chapter, I think you can download uh, from uh, actually available if you Google the PDF file. Um, so I just share this in a model. I don't put the chapter myself on the internet. It's an infringement, infringe, infringement of copyright. <laughs> so I'm not promoting that. Um, so one of, import, one of the important uh, analysis that we do for starch is the pasting properties. So we have the instrument like rapid visco analyzer or the brabender amylograph 
So we, we prepare a starch slurry, usually around 8 to 10 or 12 percent concentration, starch concentration. So meaning that we have an excess water system. So to study pasting properties, usually we do this in the excess water system, what? maybe 10, 12 percent starch. So more than 80%, more than 70% water. So it is excess water system, not limited water system. So um, then we ramp up the temperature from say room temperature up to usually 95 degree Celsius. That's enough. You don't have to go to 100 degree because more starch, more starches would start to gelatinize from 60 degree onwards. 60 to maybe 80 degree. So we don't have to go very high temperature. 95 may be enough. So we ramp up the temperature. So the red line is the temperature program. So we increase the temperature linearly, maybe around 1.5 or 2 degree per minute, slowly, linearly. Then when we reach 95, we hold. How long we hold? The standard Heating program sometimes maybe uh, a few minutes, five minutes, sometimes maybe up to 15 minutes. It depends on uh, if you want to simulate, simulate the actual process where you want to use a starch. And that process maybe will um, last probably 30 minutes maybe. And you want to know what will be the final viscosity of starch after 30 minutes of holding. So maybe you want to lengthen the, the holding period longer. But if you apply a standard heating program that is usually like rapid visco analyzer, if you have used it, there's a standard program. Program one, program two. So usually in the rapid visco analyzer, the standard holding time may be a few minutes. But then we can change that. Depends on what kind of information in terms of the stability of the starch stability, the ability of the starch to hold the viscosity at 95 degrees Celsius. So you can, it can be longer. And then after that, we start to cool down. So there's a cooling period also uh, at a constant heating, uh, at, a, at a constant uh, cooling rate. So this is when the retrogradation start. When we cool down the starch pace, uh, the, the, the onset of Retrogradation will start here. So the process is called setback. Okay? So we can measure a few parameters. One is the, the inflection point here when the viscosity start to increase. So that is called pasting, pasting temperature. So that is the onset. Then the viscosity will increase. Then we can measure peak time, meaning that how long from the beginning of the heating until the, vis until the starch reach the maximum viscosity? So what is the time? This is what, this is what uh, we measure as peak time. And that will give us some idea how long any, kind of, any type of starch that we use will reach the maximum viscosity that we want. The ease of, the ease of Pasting. How easy we can cook the starch. Something like waxy starch, remember, can swell easily. So maybe the peak time is short, relatively short. Something like Hylon 7, remember, in the previous lecture, the granule is, you know, has high amylose content, very difficult to swell compared to waxy. So the peak time if we use the same program, the peak time will be maybe much longer. So that will give an indication of the strength of the granule also, or the ability of the granule to swell. Peak viscosity, of course, very obvious. What the viscosity at the highest peak, the highest uh, viscosity achieved or attained during the pasting. Then now the breakdown is a measure of the is the difference in the <coughs> in the peak viscosity here, and the viscosity measured on the valley. This valley is called trough. Trough. 
T R O U G H, not T H R O U G H. That's true. T R O U G H. If I'm mistaken, we pronounce it thruff. Thruff. Thruff, viscosity. But we are not interested so much in the thruff viscosity. We are more interested in the difference between the peak viscosity and the holding. Uh, sorry, the the thruff viscosity. Uh, and that is a measure of breakdown. <coughs> the measure of breakdown, the, large, the larger is the value, then we can say the starch, uh, in terms of the stability of the starch, it will lose viscosity faster or lower, and how much, visco how, uh, how much it will lose the viscosity from the peak down to the trough viscosity. So this is also a measure of the stability of the starch. Okay. Um, if you have, sometimes you get a peak, you know, more not not as steep as this one. So maybe something like like that. So the breakdown is not that high. Actually, just looking from the curve, the pasting curve, we can already tell the 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 characteristic of the starch, the pasting characteristic of the starch, whether it has a high breakdown and on, and or not. Yeah? But all these values actually uh, can be calculated very easily nowadays. If you use a modern uh, rapid visco analyzer or modern visco amylograph, it is attached to a computer and it will log in all the data during the pasting uh, program. Then you will just one click or one key, one, uh, you know, a well, uh, you can calculate all the parameters easily. In the old days, in the old days, the visco amylograph is attached to a, a chart recorder, so you can, you know, then you have to calculate the boxes, and it's quite tedious actually to calculate all these parameters. But now, just one click, you get all the seven, six, seven parameters easily. So you you are living in a very easy. Uh, Era now, eh? and the same thing uh, we can also measure final viscosity. This so this is cool, during the cooling period. If you notice, during the cooling period, the viscosity start to increase. Yeah, uh, this diagram is not very accurate because I redraw the program the, the diagram. So during the cooling period, the viscosity start to increase. This is when the retrogradation start. In the pasting curve, we call it setback which is a measure of the tendency of the starch to undergo retrogradation. So those are among some of the parameters that we can measure from the pasting curve. It will give a lot, a lot of information. In this case, we have only starch and water. A simple system. So now we can use this, exp uh, this instrument if you want to study the effect of sugar, the effect of fat, the effect of other ingredients to the starch gelatinization, we just add sugar, how much sugar, the type of sugar, we add fat, we add whatever ingredients we want to study, and how it affects all these pasting parameters. So we can add into the mixture, then we can run the experiment and see what happened to the peak viscosity, what happened to the pasting temperature, and so on. Very, very useful experiment. Uh, very, very useful instrument. This is the actual pasting curve. Uh, this graph is quite old. Um, showing the comparison of pasting curve of different starches. Uh, we have the normal starch. Normal means you know, the amylose content around 20 to 25%. Amylopectin around 75%. So we have normal corn, normal sago, normal potato, but here we have potato at 8% and potato at 4%. Then we have mung bean at 6% and mung bean at 8%. You know what is mung bean? Kacang hijau. Yeah? Mung bean has a, in general, 
Mung bean has a high, relatively high amount of amylose. It can range from 30% as high as 50, around 50% or maybe 50 something percent. 30 to 50% amylose. Compared to potato, corn and sago in this graph, the amylose is perhaps around 25%. So we can see now the effect of, well, well when, when we want to compare, we have to compare on the same concentration. So if you compare, say, sago at 8%, corn at 8%, potato at 8%, and mung bean at 8%. Forget about the 4% first. So we can see potato, where is potato? Who? Very high viscosity. So that is one of the characteristic of potato starch. If we compare to other type of starch, potato has very high viscosity. Where is our sago? Our sago? I always use the term our sago. Our sago is the dash one, the dash line. Ah, about here. What about their corn? They are corn. <laughs> So corn, ah. but notice here, there's a two bumps, two small bumps here. Um, mang, mang bin, mang bin. Wow. Relative, relatively, relatively high compared to sago and corn, but not as high as potato. Here, we apply the same heating program. Had, had we used a different heating program, if we lengthen the heating time and increase the temperature, this mung bean probably would achieve as high or even higher peak viscosity compared to potato. Yeah? Because it has a higher amylose content, at this point, in time, maybe it has not reached the maximum swelling. Yeah? But if we allow it to, if we, if we heat longer and maybe higher temperature, it will be able to swell even larger, even larger than the potato, even. Yeah? So, uh, but under the similar condition, the mung bean has a lower, uh, lower a peak viscosity compared to uh, potato. And we can see potato 4%, 4% is still has a high, relatively high viscosity. So meaning that when we choose starch for application, what kind of property we want? If we want the viscosity, if we want something that has high viscosity but we want to save cost, then maybe we can use potato. But then viscosity is not everything. The kind of mouthfeel, the kind of mouthfeel that we get from starch is different. Different starch would give different mouthfeel, even at the same co solid concentration. So that's another factor that we, have, that we have to consider. Even if you feel the powder, I don't know whether you have tried this. Uh, if you feel the, 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 the powder, the flour, wheat flour, tapioca flour, rice flour, corn, they feel different also. The surface property is also different because the presence of other minor components in the flour would also affect how the surface property. So all this actually would depend on what actually you want or desire in the final product. Viscosity is not everything. Yeah? But if viscosity is the only thing that you want, then you might want to consider potato because at lower concentration you can get, you know, if you increase to maybe 6%, maybe the, the final viscosity would probably match or equivalent to sago at 8% or corn at 8%. Yeah? Another factor actually when we choose, uh, that one come later, when uh, factors that we must consider to choose starch, so I'm jumping the... Okay, I will continue. Ah, this, uh, this, uh, this graph is also tell a thousand story. Yeah? Or maybe hundred story. <laughs> uh, 
this is from uh, bra bender. So if you notice on the Y axis, bra bender unit. So meaning that we use that instrument called bra bender amylograph. If we use RVA, rapid viscoinhalation, the one that we have in the lab, so the Y axis would be the RVU unit. Yeah. Uh, and time here and the temperature here. So you can see where is the holding. 95, 95. So that is the holding. And here we start cooling. From this point, we start cooling. This holding is heating up. And we have three types of starches. Previously, uh, we look at the granule swelling under the microscope, remember? And now, we measure the increase in viscosity as a function of time and temperature. So we, can ha we have here normal maize starch, 25% amylose, 75% 75, 75 uh, amylopectin. We have waxy maize here, maize and maize, but this waxy maize, 99% amylopectin. And we have amylomase, like that hyalon 7, which is very high in amylose. And where is the curve? It's here. Almost non, I mean, uh, almost not very obvious. It's parallel to the axis, to the x-axis. But waxy mass, okay, initially, so you can see very clearly here when we, uh, when the temperature increases, we can see that we can see there's a, almost like a vertical line, which means that very rapid, very rapid increase in the viscosity, very steep. Maybe in different book or article, when you look at the pasting curve of waxy mass, maybe it's not as steep as that. It depends also on the instrument that we use, on the heating program that we use, on the amount of shear that we put in the system. So it can be slightly different. But generally, you can see there's a rapid increase in the viscosity up to point A here. Compared to uh, normal maize, yeah, there's a slight delay. It doesn't start, start here. It starts actually a bit later. And quite rapid increase in the viscosity of normal maize up to point A. But amylo maize, you don't see. You don't see even at the end of the heating, pro at the end of the holding here, still there. What about the, after it has reached the maximum peak viscosity at point A, how fast it will lose the viscosity now? Very steep also. Whereas the normal maze, it's not that steep. And the lowest point here for normal maze is here, but the waxy maze is here. So we, although we don't measure the, the, the value here, but we can say, Subjectively, visually, we can say the rate of breakdown or the extent of breakdown of waxy mass is much greater than the normal mass. Whereas the amylo mass is still there. We don't see obvious increase in viscosity, which also means that the granule has not, the granules have not swell significantly. The system the rapid, the visco, the bra, the bra bender does not detect the increase in viscosity yet, yet. But let's say, let's say, we continue to heat for a longer time. We we increase the holding time. Here, this one is quite long. You see, thirty minutes. Yeah, thirty minutes, sixty. Oh, this is very long. It's very long. But anyway, if we continue the holding, or maybe if we even increase the temperature, we will, we will, we will find that amylomase will swell and perhaps reach a peak viscosity even higher than even waximase. And the breakdown will be much smaller. So, 
using this temperature program, we are not able to functionalize the amylomase. Remember the term functionalize? Meaning that we are not able to get the functional properties of the amylomase here. We don't get the viscosity here. So if you want to functionalize the amylomase, then you need to use maybe you know, even the uh, heating under pressure, you know, like in the autoclave, so that it can swell. So this is a very uh, good picture. So obviously now we can see uh, pasting would depend on uh, these factors. Yeah? Gelatinization would affect would be affected by time of heating, temperature of heating, or the temperature program that we use, amount of shear we put in. If we use a high amount of, say, mixing and stirring during cooking, the faster the, cook, the stirring, the faster the gelatinization would start and complete. Yeah? pH, uh, the ratio, and the type of starch. So I want you to explore more on your own how these different factors affect the process of gelatinization. But again, I like to illustrate this um, with pictures because uh, you can see, you know, uh, with, with your own eyes uh, how these different factors affect. So here we have potato. Yeah, we have potato starch. This person prepared at different time, temperature, conditions. So we start by heating to 80 degree which uh, for potato already exceeding the gelatinization temperature. But there's no holding time here. One A. So we can see, uh, and we put the iodine to see the, where is the amylose, where is the amylopectin. So we can see heated to 80 degree. As I said, 80 degree is already exceeding the, the gelatinization temperature. So meaning now the granule has swelled, have swelled. And we can see, what can we say? Uh, we don't see really uh, a proper <coughs> granular shape here, but there is some, some kind of shape there. So this is uh, the term, we use the term, what, ghost granule. Is a deformed shape. Some shape compared to like this, but we can see there's some structure there, but it's not really a proper granular structure. Now we heat up this 80, now we heat up to 80, 95, still no holding time, and we can see there's more like uh, disintegration from this to this, right? But still, you can see some kind of structure. Now we heat it to 95, but with holding time for half an hour. More and more, this integration become more like, you know, uh, colloidal. Then heated at one bar over pressure. So it is under pressure now in the autoclave, maybe. For 30 minutes, even more disintegration and compare this with pre-gelatinized starch. Pre-gelatinized starch is a type of starch that we prepare by using say a drum dryer, drum drying technique. So we pour the starch slurry on the drum dryer surface then we scrape it off so we get a very thin layer then after that we grind it. So we use pre-gelatinized starch. It's already pre-cooked so you just add water you get a cooked starch. So uh, you, this pre-gelatinized starch can be used you know, in the baby food and, and so on. So the starch is already gelatinized. And in the, in the drum drying process, the, the, the starch structure is already, the granular structure is already destroyed completely. So when you add water and you prepare the paste, we see just a uniform like dispersion. You don't see a granular structure. So here very clearly you can see the effect of time temperature condition on the starch. And the 
the implication of this the implication of this different combination of time temperature is on the um, on the overall viscosity of the starch yeah so you would expect when you have some granular not granular when you have some kind of structure here the viscosity would be actually all, uh, on, on the high side here yeah? because we have now a starch piece consists of the the dispersed piece which is the solid uh, component and the, and the water which is the continuous space so in this case the viscosity would be higher compared to this one yeah and you will find also not only the viscosity even the mouth feel the mouth feel will be different so in other words the processing condition that we use to prepare the starch or any product containing the starch would affect the final organoleptic sensory property of the food especially in product with high moisture high water content like those uh, like soup the can and, and so on yeah. so the the type of starch that we choose is now become important you don't want the starch to give you the slimy blendy kind of property when you eat the soup you want it to give you a smooth creamy kind of mouthfeel if you use cornstarch for example perhaps it will give well, in fact cornstarch is being used a lot you know to make custard and so on but in imagine that you want to make a, like a Campbell soup kind of product cornstarch always give that some uh, cereal flavor to the to the product if that is what you want then fine but if you want something that would not mask the actual flavor that you want to 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 have in the product you don't want the masking effect you don't you do not want the masking effect then maybe you want to use starch which give a blend flavor something like cassava tapioca starch or potato starch they don't have they don't have their own flavor so when you add this to a product it won't interfere or mask the actual flavor of that product and what kind of mouthfeel you want something that is slimy usually maybe you don't want that something that is smooth and give the cream creamy perception so maybe you want to consider you know uh, well later we discuss about the, when we choose the, the starch i always go back to that uh, again now uh, just now potato this one is p p starch this portion prepared at different time temperature condition try to relate that with the potato just now and oops 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 okay this is potato potato at 80 95 this pea starch at 80 potato starch at 80 pea starch at 80 the difference between pea starch and potato is in the amount of amylose pea starch contain more amylose than potato so what we can say what can we say at 80 degree no holding time we can see perhaps i would say maybe well there is some structural there's some structure there i would expect I would expect under the same heating condition we have more sort of structures in the pea starch compared to the potato but from this picture maybe we cannot differentiate very much but theoretically because pea starch contain more amylose so it will pro it provides more strength to the granule so under the heat, the same heating condition i would expect the rate or the extent of granular rupture or breakdown is slightly less than compared to potato but we can't really tell from this picture uh, but when we hit 295 degree for 30 minutes holding time for 30 minutes 
This is potato, 95 degree for 30 minutes. Maybe this, this is clearer. This is potato, 95, 30 minutes. Capture the picture. This is uh, P, 95, 30 minutes. Can, can, can you tell the difference? It, it looks like this, ha this one has more steel, more structure left, right? This one may be not very clear if we compare with this one. But this one is clearer when we compare to this one. When this heated at one bar over pressure, still can see some ghost granule there compared to heated at one bar over pressure for 30 minutes. So this picture illustrates very clearly the difference. We cannot find this comparison in the textbook, only in my book, which, have not, which will be published in maybe 2020. <laughs> now, with starch, let's say with starch at 80 degree, no holding time. Potato, P, wheat. 95 at 30 minutes. 95 at 30 minutes for P. 95 for 30 minutes for potato. We can tell the difference, right? So, the conclusion from this is that, very simple, different type of starch would show different degree of gelatinization, different degree of viscosity and pasting properties. Depends on the type of starch, depends on the combination of temperature, uh, time, com shear, pH, and all those factors. Now, this graph is from the uh, actual experiment. So, uh, in this experiment, we heat the starch. So, we allow the starch to undergo swelling and you know, the whole pasting event. And we measure the increase in the volume. Volume of what? We measure volume. What, what, do, what do we think, uh, what kind of volume that we measure here? Hmm? Granular. The granule volume. But we don't measure, and we are not able to measure a single granule. We measure the total. Yeah? The total volume of the granules when they swell. So we, we measure that as a function of heating time. So the heating time increased from zero to oh, this in minutes. 2880 minutes. And we also measure the increase in the mean diameter of the granules. So this is at zero minutes. So this is still the native starch. Starch, sorry before it starts to swell. <coughs> so it's a raw hydrated granule. So we can see it's not exactly a unimodal distribution. We have some uh, granule. So it's like, a, in this case, like uh, what, what do you call uh, bimodal distribution. Next, 60 minutes and 540 minutes. Next, ruptured granules. So initially, at 60 minutes, the blue line, the curve, so this curve represents a distribution, right? A distribution, meaning that you have some small size, some average, some large. Then you can see on at 60 minutes, the, the blue line first, it will shift to the right and look at 
the volume per cent and the mean diameter. So it clearly shows that the granule swell increase in volume, increase in diameter, average, total. And now we increase the heating time to longer. to 540 minutes. Now we can see the, the green line, in, instead of shifting further to the right, it shift actually slightly you know, back to the left. And the height, which represents the total volume, is slightly lower than the blue line. What does that mean? What does that indicate? Yeah, exactly. But you don't say it with confidence. <laughs> yeah, that indicates that some of the granules start to rupture. Remember, we measure now is the average diameter, average volume. So when some of the volumes, uh, some of the granules start to rupture, reduce the total volume a bit, right? And similarly, also the uh, the mean average diameter. Now, when we increase further the heating time, it will shift even further to the left, and uh, the volume also will be so. This is one experiment uh, which we can use, which, which we can do by using uh, in, instrument uh, to measure the particle size. Uh, in USM, we have like in the pharmacy school, we have uh, red, uh, we have what Melvin particle analyzer. We can measure the volume as well as the diameter very easily. So uh, we can capture this kind of information, which clearly demonstrate or illustrate uh, the the sequence of event in terms of the changes during heating on the swelling, on the increase in diameter, increase in the volume, and also when we increase the heating time, we can see also the decrease in the volume and the decrease in the diameter. So there are many ways, many ways we can monitor and observe the process of cooking, the process of gelatinization by using microscope, by using uh, DSC, by using this way, yeah. So, someone asked in the end model, what is G term, endotherm, M1 endotherm? Uh, yeah, I have replied that. Uh, so, when we use DSC, previously we discussed gel gelatinization under excess water and under limited water, right? So, we can uh, we can use DSC, then we get an endotherm. Yeah. So. Uh, but anyway, uh, in excess moisture, excess water system in the DSC, we will get we will get only one endothermic peak, that is called the G endotherm. But in the limited water content, in limited water content, instead of one, we get two. Two endothermic peak. Uh, by the way, gelatinization is endothermic process. Okay, we require heat, we require heat to break up the hydrogen bond. Uh, in the granular, in the granules between the amylopectin, crystal, and so on. So, in the limited water content, we get the G endotherm and also the M1 endotherm. So, when we when we do an uh, DSC study, when you get when you get two endothermic peak, it shows that you are operating under you are gelatinizing the starch under low or limited water content less than 60 percent. Something like if you add a starch, one part of starch with one part of water, that's 50-50. So in this case, you will get, and you heat up the, the starch in the sample pan in the DSC. So in this case, you will get to the G and the M1 endotherm. If you want to read more about, I think the, in the book by Edwell, uh, they describe also this briefly about the G and M1 endotherm. 
But the the simple point from that is that it will tell you whether you are gelatinizing the starch under excess moisture, excess water, or low water content. That's all. The theory behind that is, of course, a lot, but at this level, maybe you don't have to explore too much in that. We just want to take the practical information from that. Oof. So I guess we stop here. I'm not in my best uh, energetic condition today. Uh, so we stop here. I'll see you all next week. Eh?